It's now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Speaker. Speaker, my first question is to the Minister of Education. Uh, does the Ford government think that 42, 46 students is too many for high school classrooms? Minister of Education. Well, Speaker, you know, let's talk about realities. And the fact is, the CBC on March 25th did a fact check. Yeah. And even with our announcement, they concurred that Ontario, once we take a look at our class sizes, which I'll remind everybody today, from K to grade three, we're not changing no change. any size. There's no change. no change in K to grade three. From grades four to eight, there could be as many as one more student. Wow. One more student added to the, the class, world is coming to an end. and then in high school, with our more mature senior students, we're taking a look at increasing the cl average class size to 28. And speaker, the CBC fact check confirmed on March 25th that even with the changes that we announced that we're looking at in our plan, we're still one of the lowest mm -hmm. class sizes across. Canada. The so the Leader of the Opposition should be well advised to stop fear-mongering because the fact of the matter Look, is she is starting to lose Bonds. credibility with the average uh, uh, parent out there little. that is tired of all the rhetoric that is coming saying. from the Opposition Party. And because you know what? We're getting it right, Speaker. We Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will remind the members that when the Speaker stands up, your microphone goes dead and you need to conclude your response. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Halton District School Board wrote to the minister yesterday, and they warn the Halton District School Board warns that to make the government's new class size policy work, some classes will swell to as much as 46 kids in the classroom. They warn that quote this situation will inevitably inevitably lead to eliminating course offerings with low enrollment, even though those courses may be the top choice for some students. End quote. Can the minister tell us how? How many boards have sent her similar warnings? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I can tell you this. I can tell you that we are never, ever going to play political games when it comes to the success of our students in the classroom. And when it comes to school boards across the province, we want to work with our education partners. As I've said time and again in this House, I introduced our education plan, education that works for you, on March 15th. And we also have, in association with that announcement, we're inviting our education partners to work with us in good faith. Come to the table and let's talk about how do we get the education system in Ontario yeah, yeah. back on track oh, after 15 years of failed experiments and ideology under the Liberal administration. And so again, I'd like to remind everyone, I invite our education partners to work with us. Come to the table in good faith. I'm looking forward to your submissions until May 31st. Thank you very much, Speaker. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, bad education policy is bad education policy, no matter how this minister tries to fancy it up. School boards, teachers, students, and parents are all warning the Ford government that their classroom cuts are cheating the next generation of young people in our province. It's not just the Halton Board, Speaker. The Durham Board wrote to the minister warning that, quote, course options will diminish drastically, especially in the area of the arts, trades, and specialty subjects, end quote. The evidence is clear. The Ford government's plan means fewer course options, larger classes, and thousands of fired teachers and education workers. Will the minister tell us what other warnings she has received from experts in the field? Minister, what's, what's very, very clear, Speaker, is that the opposition party is getting very tired and they're just pulling out old talking points because the yeah. fact of the matter is yeah. our education yeah. plan, education that works yeah. for yeah. you, yeah. is getting well-received yeah. remarks yeah. in the yeah. sense yeah. that yeah. Our, yeah. our math strategy, phasing in new math curriculum yeah. over four yeah. years, is getting incredibly well-received. Yeah. Our focus on mental health, the first time ever in Ontario, physical and health education, yeah. is going to be incredibly yeah. well done and well-placed and well-timed, if I might add. You know, uh, my friend to the left of me mentioned that it seems like today NDP stands for um, 
No, nothing, no but doom. Doom. nothing but doom party, and that's what we're hearing. Nothing but doom and gloom is coming from the opposition, Order. when we should be celebrating that after 15 years of mismanagement and failed experiments and, and ideology, we're actually finally putting our students first. We're focused on student success. Spons? We're focused on getting the curriculum back on track, here, and here. I'm very proud of that. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is also to the Minister of Education. One of the measures from the Ford government that's most concerning to students, Speaker, is their decision to make online learning mandatory for high school students. Until a month ago, the Ontario eLearning Consortium warned on their website that, quote, eLearning may not be for everyone. Oh. A warning that mysteriously disappeared shortly after the minister made her announcement. If e-learning may not work for every student, why is the uh, minister forcing every student into it? Minister of Education. Well, Speaker, apparently NDP now, based on this question, stands for no digital party. Oh. Because the fact of the matter is, oh. this party They're not embracing technology for good. It is absolutely mind-boggling that they do not want to see students in Ontario embracing technology and all the good that it represents. And what we're talking about in our rollout of online classes is that by the time an Ontario student graduates from high school, they will need to have taken four online courses. This is something that absolutely is a fit in today's world based on the realities of jobs, not, not only no today, but into, into tomorrow as well. And for goodness Fonts. sakes, there's colleges, there's universities that have bulks of cor bulk of courses online, yep. and we're just following suit and making sure that our students in Ontario have the skills Thank you. they need. To Thank you. Supplementary. What can we up to? Well, Speaker, notwithstanding the minister's silly name-calling, the vanishing warning is just one issue. Stop the clock. The government side will come to order. Minister of Government and Consumer Services, come to order. Government House Leader, come to order. Restart the clock. I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition. The vanishing warning is just one issue that's being raised by an academic who's just completed the very first study of online learning in Toronto schools. She concludes, and I quote, if the government heads in this direction, students will suffer, end quote. She warns that the government has not invested sufficiently in building capacity and research, and that this e-learning is more about saving money than helping students to succeed. Does the minister have any evidence that counters the findings in this study, Speaker? Minister. Hello, Speaker. Well, absolutely I do. Just recently, the Harvard Business Review actually touted the merits of online ah. courses. And so, seriously, we could go study for study all day if you like, Leader of the Opposition. I'll, I'll meet that challenge. I'll go study to study. But the fact of the matter is, our students need to be learning the skills that they require for the jobs of today and tomorrow. When post-secondary education is embracing online courses, for goodness sakes, the least we can do is make sure our high school students, when they graduate, are prepared, are prepared for that reality. Speaker, we are doing an amazing job of getting education back on track. And once for all, I think the, the opposition like the party subway. needs to embrace the fact that we are getting good reviews on our education plan, and we're Response. moving forward in a very thoughtful manner that is a result of listening and consulting, and most of all, generating results that will give parents confidence that their kids and their learning environment. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, when school boards and parents and young people and educators are all panning their education changes, I think that this minister's got a very distorted view of what people think of their education plan. But here's, 
Here's what students and parents do see. A government that's firing teachers, eliminating courses, cramming students into even larger classrooms, and forcing every student, every single student, regardless if they can learn very well in that method, into online learning. Now, despite the overwhelming expert evidence that online learning does not work for every student, this isn't about building resiliency, Speaker. It's about cuts to the classroom. Cuts to the classroom that this party made the last time they were in government that damaged kids and their education then and are about to do it again to our young people. Question. Students will pay the price, Speaker. Will the minister back away from these reckless cuts? The member for Niagara West will come to order. The member for Flanbrook must come to order. Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think in that last question, we finally have hit the nail on the head as to what the what the real reason is for the reason uh, the real reason is for the the angle that the opposition party is taking, and that is because they're doing the union's bidding oh. and creating fear mongering and absolutely spinning question. things. Because the fact of the matter is, when I'm out and about, when I was out at an education event last week, I had retired principals coming up and hugging me and saying, "Finally, somebody is getting it straight and standing up." for our classrooms here, here. in Ontario. I'm telling you, parents are celebrating that we're going to get back to the basics and focusing on the fundamentals. And you know what? Our, our business world, our employers are absolutely celebrating the fact that we're going to focus in Response. on the jobs of today and tomorrow. Skilled trades are a wonderful career. A, a plethora of careers are, are enveloped into skilled trades. And I can't wait for students to be learning the skills and the skills. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Members, take your seats. Restart the clock. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is uh, to the Minister of Health. For many people living with chronic pain, news that the government is set to make drastic cuts to OHIP-covered pain management treatment is very concerning. It'll mean that their conditions could worsen, their symptoms could go untreated, they could lose out on opportunities for their careers and may be forced to stop working altogether because they cannot deal with their pain. People in Ontario living with chronic pain deserve to know now what crucial medications are being taken away from them by this government. Will the minister confirm which pain management treatments are going to be cut? Questions to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you. Well, I thank the Leader of the Official Opposition for the question because there was some erroneous information that was printed in a news article that was based on some discussions that were held in the Associated Working Group between the Ontario Medical Association and the Ministry of Health. There were some suggestions there that have not been made have not happened and in fact that particular issue with respect to pain medications is not on the table. I have not even seen this list myself. This is not something that has been approved by the ministry Order. and what we are going to do is make decisions based on evidence and discussions are still concluding but there is no indication there is no um, de decision that has been made with respect to those pain medications. We know that people with chronic pain depend on these medications and nerve blocks, and so we will be continuing with them. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, sadly, Ontarians have seen what happens when this minister doesn't see reports or bills, or when this minister claims that something is not on the table. We end up finding out that, in fact, it has been on the table all along. One of the cuts to pain medication that the government's proposing uh, is to peripheral nerve blocking shots, which is to be reduced to only 16 allowable shots a year, less than a week's worth of medicine for some people. For Ontario med uh, patients, these medications are an effective alternative to opioid speaker. Right. But if they're forced to go without, there's growing concern from doctors that patients will see uh, will seek out rather prescriptions to opioids or even worse, try to find those opioids on the streets. Will the minister consider the needs of Ontarians living with chronic pain before she approves any cuts? Minister. 
Well, of course, patients' needs and priorities are the utmost in our minds, and that's what we make our decisions based upon that. But what I would say through you, Speaker, to the Leader of the Official Opposition is I always see documents before decisions are made. And in the situation that I believe you're referring to, that was material that was taken from the ministry and was provided to you directly before I had the opportunity to see it because it was something that wasn't even up for discussion. So, in answer to your specific question, of course, we are going to keep patients' needs in priority, and we are going to make decisions based on evidence. And if patients need the medication and need that nerve pain, of, uh, pain for nerves or whatever else they have, they will be receiving it. We will make decisions that are in the best interest of patients based on our discussions Response. with them and on the experts who understand exactly what the evidence suggests is best. We start the clock. Next question, the member for Oakville North Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Honourable Minister of Education. I know the Minister has announced a number of initiatives to help protect our students and put Ontario back on track when it comes to education. It was obvious that the last government was not only failing our students when it came to basic life skills like math, but that they also had no respect for our parents. When I speak to parents in my community of Oakville North Burlington, they told me that they felt their voices weren't heard. Speaker, can the Minister of Education tell us what our government is doing to protect our students and ensure our parents are being heard again? Questions to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, and Speaker. I absolutely admire our member from Oakville, North Burlington. She does such a stand-up job, and I'm so pleased that we're building a school in your riding. I look forward to that opening here, here. days to come. Speaker, back to the question. Over the last few months, we have taken a number of steps to protect our students and ensure parents are being respected. Our government has been very clear. The last Liberal administration thumbed their nose at parents. They absolutely ignored them, and we are making steps uh, that are very clear-footed. We are consulting and listening, most importantly, to modernize and improve Ontario's education system. Through our consultation specifically, we conducted um, just enormous opportunities for parents to be heard, and we heard a range of opinions. But there was a common thread speaker. One thing was Response. always clear. The last government, as I said, never listened to parents, so I'm pr so proud to stand with all my colleagues today wearing pink to stand up against bullying and recognize that so there's something we can all do. Thank you. Supplementary. Through you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It's refreshing to hear a government that is listening to the people and respecting parents. I know the Minister listens because, as she said, she listened to the parents in my growing community when they told her they desperately needed a new school in Northeast Oakville. And I know that many parents were excited to hear about our modern, comprehensive approach focused on student success and achievement. But parents also told me that they are concerned about a number of other items that were simply not covered in the previous curriculum. Could the minister tell us more about what she has introduced in this new curriculum? Minister. Great. Thank you very much. Speaker, today's students need to know how to respect one another and how to use technology safety, safely, excuse me, and they need to know what healthy relationships look like. We heard that loud and clear through our consultations, and that is why I'm so proud to stand here today, Speaker, and share with you that by next September, we'll have a modern, age-appropriate health and physical education curriculum that will reflect the desires of parents and reflect the needs of students and will be supported by teachers across Ontario. Again, our age-appropriate curriculum will have a focus on student safety but we're covering a wide array of topics. Starting in grade one, our students will hear about the important concepts like mental health, online safety, and concussions. By grade six, our students will be taught about more complex topics like substance abuse and addictions. And speaker, Spons. I can tell you, we heard from over 72,000 Ontarians and we've listened. By next year, any parent who feels that they need extra resources at home to teach these subjects 
will have access to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. One of the first acts by this government was to cut $330 million in funding for mental health and addictions. All while, children and youth needing life-saving mental health and addictions care are on wait lists for years. And more than three people— Stop the clock. Government side has to come to order so I can hear the member who has the floor, legitimately has the floor, to ask a question on behalf of her constituents. I apologize to the member for Parkdale High Park. Start the clock. And more than three people die every day of an overdose. Speaker, the people of Ontario deserve better. Will the minister commit to restoring the $330 million cut to mental health and addictions? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, first, through you, Speaker, I, I need to correct an inaccuracy. In fact, our government is increasing support for mental health and addictions. $3.8 billion over 10 years. A $1.9 billion from the provincial government, matched by $1.9 billion from the federal government. And we are using those funds to create a connected, comprehensive mental health and addictions plan for the province of Ontario. I do hope to obtain the views from all members of the legislature, from the government side, from the official opposition side, and from the independent parties, because this is an issue that is very important for all Ontarians. It is not a partisan issue, and we all need to get this right. So I look forward to having further discussions with you and any other members of your caucus that are interested in providing opinions. On the side of the addictions piece, this is something that is very important to us. We are actively involved Spons. in opening new centers, centers, receiving applications. Fifteen have been approved. We have six more to go. We are listening to areas where there is significant need. We want to make sure Thank you very much. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. Speaker, we've heard the minister say it time and time again, but we have not seen the money flow, and there has been no concrete action. The only action we've seen so far is the $330 million cut and the defunding of six overdose prevention sites. The mental health and addiction crisis that we are facing needs immediate action, not empty words. I ask again. Will the minister commit to restoring the $330 million cut from mental health and addictions funding? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Again, I repeat, we are increasing funding for mental health and addiction services. And that is happening. There has been money already spent from money that was available from last year into housing, into increasing supports for our mental health and addictions agencies. That money is flowing. But what we want to make sure as we go forward is that we need to have a connected and comprehensive system. We don't have that infrastructure right now in mental health and addiction, so I'm sure that everyone in the legislature and all the people in Ontario who are watching today want to make sure that they are good investments that are actually going to help people. So we are actively working on that plan now. We will be in contact with you very shortly to obtain your views because we want to make sure that we get this right. It's a lot of money to spend, but it has to be spent wisely to make sure that we help people with mental health and addiction. Order. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. For the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Speaker, the previous government's culture of waste and inefficiency cost the people of Ontario their precious taxpayer dollars. We inherited an electricity system that was not working for the people of Ontario. Our government was elected to bring much needed change to the electricity system after 15 years of mismanagement. With Bill 87, we are delivering on our promise to improve the electricity system. This includes the modernization of the Ontario Energy Board, or OEB. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell the members of this House why it is so important to modernize the OEB? Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, Indigenous Affairs. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, when I first tried this as Canada's Minister of Natural Resources, it was clear stakeholders wanted change. They wanted modernization. Here in Ontario, 
uh, they need it. I've never seen a group of stakeholders clamor in desperation, Mr. Speaker, for fundamental changes. Stemming from the governance structure, Mr. Speaker, undue delays. OEB had come to stand for the Ontario Energy Bureaucracy as yeah. projects bureaucracy. mounted with uh, significant amounts of paper requirements right, for fairly routine uh, uh, regulations, Mr. Speaker. Delays on key projects in regions uh, of Ontario that were desperate for projects to move ahead. I'm thinking, of course, of the East-West High, a trained workforce, more than 275 Indigenous workers ready to go on the East-West High, communities' uh, energy infrastructure at stake, Mr. Speaker. Response. We broke through for them. Moving forward, the Ontario Energy Board is going to be modernized and work for Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that clear and concise answer. I am certain that our government will ensure the OEB becomes a competent regulator once again. It's essential that we can rely on the energy regulator as we continue expanding our electricity system with exciting energy projects. As Ontario becomes open for business, we will have new energy demands and we need the OEB to be ready to respond. A more efficient OEB will provide will provide an incentive for new businesses to invest in Ontario. They can be sure that our government is ready to meet the energy needs of the new employers. Can the minister please tell us more about how our OEB modernization will make Ontario open for business? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mentioned uh, those stakeholders. The Electricity Distributors, Distributors Association said, quote, with Bill uh, 87, the Electricity Distributors Association is pleased that this government has decided to listen to industry and stakeholders about regulatory reform and cutting the red tape in Ontario's energy industry. Susanna Robbins, Vice President of EPCOR, said, quote, EPCOR is enthused about investing hundreds of millions of dollars here for years to come. We applaud the minister's efforts, oh, that's nice, efforts to improve the board's functions and governance, and we look forward to experiencing these changes firsthand as we expand our business footprint in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, modernizing the OEB puts Ontario in a better position to be open for business, and that's precisely it. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Kiewetanum. To me, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, this question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. This week, uh, the Minister spoke about the government's commitment uh, to making the North open for business and said that the Ministry was properly engaging all stakeholders on the Far North Act. Proper engagement on such an important act uh, should not be rushed, and, uh, and it involves more than two hearings in Northern Ontario. By rushing hearings and making communities travel to give evidence, many community voices will be missed. Mr. Speaker, will the minister make a commitment today uh, to uh, proactively and fully engage with First Nations on what happens in the far, far north. Miigwech. Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank the, uh, the member for that question. And that is something that uh, we are absolutely committed to do, and that is engagement with our Indigenous peoples and First Nations. And my colleague, uh, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, uh, is looking after that side of it. He is the will lead those engagement sessions uh, with our Indigenous peoples. I want to point out very clearly, Speaker, that when the Far North Act was brought in by the previous government, there was no engagement with Indigenous peoples. They did not want it. We heard from all across the Far North with Indigenous peoples and with every other citizen across the Far North, businesses and otherwise, they did not want the Far North Act. We are now committed to improving the situation, bringing jobs and development back to the Far North, giving them an opportunity to enjoy the prosperity that other people in Ontario depend on. So I'm going to be working with my colleague, Bonds. the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development and Mines, and working to fully engage First Nations to ensure that they have the opportunities that they deserve as well. Here, here. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, First Nations in the far north uh, want to benefit from the resources in their tree lands. But many First Nations are concerned the minister is undermining the duty to consult when he refers to cutting red tape. Mm -hmm. Speaker, First Nations are not red tape. Here, here. Supporting the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples gives the government the path to resource development they need. 
through you, Mr. Speaker, I'm here to tell the government, Far North is not open for business without involvement, without the involvement and, and development with our territories. Will the minister commit to respecting our treaty rights through meaningful consultation and involvement with communities affected by the Far North Act? Thank you. Members, please take their seats. And I recognize the minister to reply. To the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate the Honourable Member's question. In fact, I had a, an opportunity to discuss uh, this matter with uh, Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler yesterday. Uh, look, Mr. Speaker, we're focused on an act here that was never consulted in the first place for those communities. I haven't met a First Nations leader in my extensive time living and working up there who liked anything about this act, Mr. Speaker. Designations of park status on some of their traditional lands and including some of their uh, uh, reservation lands, Mr. Speaker. This is completely unacceptable. It is it has put a stop to uh, good business opportunities in Northern Ontario. Of course, First Nations communities, Mr. Speaker, ought to have, as my learned colleague said, uh, every Aunts. opportunity to develop their resources, participate in the economic activity, and see an improvement in the overall conditions, economic conditions, and prospects in their communities moving forward. And that's exactly what we intend to deliver. Thank you. Next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Since the Ford government came to power, we've seen devastating cuts for workers, families, and children in Ontario. Premier Ford and his hatchet team have cut jobs and slashed public services that people depend on. This made me wonder, is Doug Ford the anti-Marie Kondo? This made me look at, because if it sparks joy, Doug Ford cuts it. Joy that students feel in classrooms with engaged teachers. Premier Ford fires 3,500 teachers. Joy that parents and of autistic children felt knowing that their child is getting the treatment that they need when Doug Ford made dramatic changes. And the member of I'll remind all members, we refer to each other by our riding names or our ministerial responsibility. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The member for Mississauga East, Cooksville, will come to order. The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, will come to order. The member for Niagara West will come to order. We're going to allow the member for Scarborough Guildwood to ask her question in a manner that I can hear her. Please restart the clock. Member for Scarborough Guildwood has the floor. The Ford government made dramatic cuts to autism services, sending families into panic and turmoil. Joy that low income students. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. <laughs> Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry will come to order. Did anybody over there hear what I just said? Some of you did. I appreciate it. Once again, the member for Scarborough Guildwood has the floor. Tomorrow's budget will be more of the same, with attempts to distract from cuts with beer at sporting games. Stop the clock again. Okay. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services will come to order. Restart the clock. Again, I apologize to the member for Scarborough Guildwood. To the Deputy Premier, through you, Speaker, what will the anti Marie Kondo Premier cut next? The question is to the Deputy Premier. To the Government House Leader. Who's been referred to the Government House Leader? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, to the member opposite, she takes the most circuitous route to actually ask a question in this House that we don't know what she's asking. At the end of the day, I can tell you with great certainty, though, that this government, led by Premier Ford, will be bringing subways to Scarborough, and it will be a direct route that everybody can take, Mr. Speaker. And we won't be cutting schools there. Mr. Speaker. 
After 15 long years of inaction from the Liberal government of which the member opposite was a part of, a government that cut 600 schools across Shame. Ontario under her watch, we will be making investments in Ontario, whether it's with transit, education, health care. We're going to get Ontario moving back on the right track, Mr. Speaker. And today's Fox. announcement announcing subways to Scarborough is step number one in doing just that, Mr. Speaker. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, we welcome the, the subway actually being built in Scarborough. Yeah. Speaker, Marie Kondo has inspired a decluttering movement, telling people to get rid of anything that doesn't spark joy. The anti-Marie Kondo premier has done the opposite. If it sparks joy, he cuts it, like the joy that communities felt knowing that energy conservation programs now cancelled were making the air cleaner to breathe for children, the joy that basic income pilot gave to families as they plan for a brighter future, it is now taken away under this government. The renewed joy in the support found in the wake of violence or abuse with the cut to rape crisis centres, that joy taken away. Question. Even Ontario's Chamber of Commerce and the FAO is warning Finance Minister Vic Fazelli about reckless cuts, reminding him that Ontario already has relatively Thank you. Thank you. The question has been referred to the government house leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I can tell you it's with great joy that I get to stand in my place here again today, and it was with great joy this morning that the Premier and our Minister of Transportation and a number of members of our GTA caucus stood there and talked about the investments that our government is going to be making for the people of Scarborough, for the people of North Toronto, for the people of downtown Toronto, for the people of the GTHA, and that's on top of the investments that we announced earlier this month and last month when it comes to transit right across Ontario. All of our communities are going to benefit from the work that our Premier and our Minister of Transportation are doing to make Ontario move again. And that's not just getting people from here to there, Mr. Speaker. That's ensuring that we're allowing our economy to move again, an economy yeah. that has been stuck in gridlock. Over 300,000 lost manufacturing jobs under that member's government, Mr. Speaker. We're going to get the economy Response. moving again. We're going to get people moving again. We're we're going to get Ontario moving again and making sure that it's in its rightful place as our leader in Confederation when it comes to the economy. <laughs> Order. Restart the clock. The next question is the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Deputy Premier and the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. And, uh, Speaker, our government is committed to delivering on our promise to end uh, hallway health care. I've heard time and time again from uh, my constituents across Haldeman Norfolk that building a public health care system centered around patients is very important for them. That's why I'm quite heartened our government has introduced the People's uh, Health Care Act so that patients and families will have access to faster, better, and uh, more connected services. So, Speaker, would the minister please inform the members of this legislature why our proposed changes are so desperately needed for our health care system? Good question. Deputy Premier, Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Alderman Norfolk for the great question, and I can tell you that I have heard from thousands of Ontarians on this issue, including patients, families, and caregivers. And from these countless hours of conversation, I've heard the same refrain, Mr. Speaker: Our health care system is broken. The health care system is facing capacity pressures, but it does not have the right mix of services, beds, or digital tools to be ready for a growing and rapidly aging population 
with increasingly complex health care needs. That is why we are building a public health care system centred around, around the patient and redirecting money to frontline services where it belongs to improve the patient experience and to provide better and more connected care. I will have Supplementary. Thank the uh, Minister for that response. And uh, As the Minister has just indicated, there's no doubt our health care system needs immediate attention. And, uh, Speaker, it, it's no secret. Former Liberal government left us with a health care system on life support. I, along with my colleagues in this legislature, have been hearing dozens and dozens of unfortunate stories from people on the state of our health care system in the province. My, consist my constituents, and as you've indicated, uh, ministers from many people in Ontario, would certainly benefit from a patient-centered health care system. My question, Speaker, could the minister please inform this House how the People's Health Care Act, if passed, will address the pressures facing our health care system? And secondly, how will this act improve patient care? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you again to the member. Our government is making the necessary changes to build a modern, sustainable system that will improve access to care and emphasize a patient-centered approach. If we expect real improvements that patients will experience firsthand, we must better coordinate the public health care system so it is org organized around people's needs and outcomes. This will enable local teams of health care providers to know and understand each patient's needs and provide the appropriate, high-quality, connected care that Ontarians deserve and expect. Yeah. By relentlessly focusing on the patient experience and on better connected care, we will reduce wait times and end hallway medicine. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question today is for the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Today, people with disabilities from across Ontario, Speaker, are converging right here at Queen's Park because we're hosting an open forum for them. They are fed up with our province's agonizingly slow progress towards making this province fully accessible and the barriers that are preventing them from living their lives to the fullest. In his report on the third review of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, the Honourable David Donnelly said the following, and I'll quote, For most disabled persons, Ontario is not a place of opportunity, but one of countless, dispiriting, soul-crushing barriers, end quote. Speaker, my question to the minister. Do you accept the findings, Minister, of the Omni Report? The Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for raising that question. I First of all, I'd like to thank Honorable David Only. He did a marvelous job. I read the report. <laughs> you know, I'd like to refer that question to the Liberal Party. They've been in government. 15 years, the accessibility is not done even 30 minutes of 30 percent. So, uh, by the way, I will drop by your town hall meeting, and uh, our government is open for business for everybody, even with the people with disability. And I'll try my best as minister. So thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, the Minister, for that answer. But 1.9 million Ontarians with disabilities, they actually deserve better. This is a human rights issue, and stalling any further and only looking backwards is not an option. The AODA sets a target for this province to be fully accessible by 2025, but the Onley Report says we are nowhere near achieving that goal. Mr. Onley has 15 recommendations, Speaker, to the Minister for improving accessibility through stronger enforcement new standards for buildings, and making sure public money is never used again to create new barriers. Will the minister be releasing a plan, Speaker, of action in response to the Onley report? And if so, Speaker, when can we expect that plan of action? Minister. Thank you again for, for the question. After the uh, Honourable David Onley uh, completed his review and will we tabled the, uh, the review, and I talked to him three times. I went to see him, and uh, he emphasized getting job 
for people with disabilities is most important. That's where we're going to focus, and I'm going to hold my own town meeting with the business community. Thank you for the question. Hey. Members, take your seats. Next question. The member, House come to order, member for Lanark Frontenac Kingston. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. Minister, last year Jennifer Wheeler took her son Nicholas to Chio for care. Eleven year old Nicholas suffers with Lyme disease. Nicholas also receives treatment for Lyme by a physician in New York because of our outdated standards of care are not working. Because Nicholas goes to the U.S. for treatment, the physician at, Ch at Chio lodged a complaint with the Children's Aid Society against Jennifer and her family and filed a complaint with the College of Physicians and Surgeons against their family doctor. Minister, Ontario's health system often treats people with Lyme in a reprehensible and atrocious manner. Will you meet with Jennifer Wheeler and her team of professionals to discuss a pilot project to reform these outdated attitudes and harmful practices and help people who are suffering with Lyme disease. Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. I am sorry about the trouble that Jennifer and Nicholas have gone through, but I want you to know that our ministry does take the issue of Lyme disease very seriously. We are constantly uh, consulting and reviewing areas of risk, including certain geographic risks in the province of Ontario. And so I would be happy to meet with, uh, with Jennifer and Nicholas and their team to discuss their situation and to discuss the pilot project that they have in mind. We are looking for solutions, and we would be happy to hear from them about that. You're here. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you for that response, Minister. It will, uh, I'm sure Jennifer and her family will appreciate that response. Um, fortunately, Alex Munt Munter, the Ch CEO of CHEO, also stepped up to the plate for the Wheeler family when he heard of the abuses that had happened, and I commend him for his actions as well. Ontario needs significant reforms on how we diagnose and treat Lyme disease. If it was left to our current standards of care, Nicholas would have continued to suffer as he did before receiving care out of country. Minister, Alex Munter did the right thing. You're doing the right thing. I would like to see you also direct the appropriateness group to investigate the state of Lyme disease diagnostics and treatments so that Nicholas and thousands of people with, Lee, with Lyme are not treated as unimportant or, as in the case of the Wheeler family, as criminals. Thank you. Minister to reply again. Well, thank you very much. I agree with you that Alex Munter is doing a wonderful job at CHEO, and I'm glad that he was able to provide some assistance to, to Jennifer and to Nicholas. But and certainly it is an issue that can be referred to the appropriateness group to discuss because there is more work to be done. There's no question on the issue of Lyme disease in Ontario. But it's also an issue of public health. I have had some conversations with our public health officials about uh, Lyme disease and what else we need to do. It is an area that is under study, but uh, I think the more eyes that we can get on it, the more opinions we can hear about it from people who know what the solutions are and have that evidence, uh, we are certainly open to hearing from them, including uh, Jennifer Nicholas and her, her group of people as well. So here, here. absolutely, we want to hear from them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Oh, <laughs> Minister, over the past several months, our government held consultations on modernizing the Real Estate and the Business Brokers Act. Real estate is a major part of our province's economy, and ensuring rules are up to date, efficient and effectively is key to ensuring our provincial and open for business and open for jobs. Yeah. Speaker, I know constituents in my writing of Don Valley Notes were inter very interested in this review. They want, they want to know 
they are protected when buying, selling, or renting a home. Yeah. Speaker, could the minister Question. update the legislature on the input they receive from Ontarians about rebuild and the rules and regulations governing the real estate industry? Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague from Don Valley West, Vincent Kaw, for his excellent question and the excellent work he does on behalf of his constituents. My esteemed colleague is correct. Public consultations on the Real Estate and Business Brokers Act closed on March 15th. I'm pleased to say we received over 6,500 responses from industry professionals, former and current realtors, and the people of Ontario. Sadly, like so many areas of government, the previous Liberal government allowed real estate laws and regulations to stagnate over the last 15 years of their reign. Of course, over that time, the market has changed dramatically. Our goal in reviewing REBA, REBA our goal, is, as everything we do in government, is to ensure the rules and regulations governing business and members of the public are clear, modern, fair and efficient. That is exactly what this review is allowing us to do. Mr. Speaker, we are currently in the process of reviewing those 6,500 6, submissions, and I'll, I will be pleased to update this House on the findings once we've completed that review. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would like to thank the Minister for his answer. I know how important this issue is to so many of my constituents. And I know many of them are, are we are shocked to find out that in the ever-changing real estate market, which the previous Liberal government allows rules and regulations. I'm very pleased to hear that over 6,500 Ontarians make their voice heard by taking part in the minister's consultations. Speaker, could the minister outline what he has shared from Ontarians during these consultations and highlight some of the out-of-date rules which the Liberal kept on the books for the previous 15 years? Minister. And the member from Don Valley Again, North. thank you, Speaker, to my colleague from Don Valley North for the great work he's doing. We're currently reviewing those 6,500 responses we received from industry professionals and materials buying, selling, and or renting their homes. We heard a wide range of views, Mr. Speaker, and we're taking time to develop the right solutions for the people of Ontario. Our review is looking at areas such as consumer protection, greater transparency in the offer process, and improved disclosures. We're also considering enhanced professionalism, modern regulations, and creating a strong business environment. Mr. Speaker, the real estate sector is a major part of Ontario's economy. I heard loud and clear that Ontario needs rules governing the real estate industry that are modern, fair, and effective. We are committed to doing just that, Mr. Speaker, and I'll provide this House with an update on our government's plan of action once we've completed those 6,500 reviews for the people of Ontario. Very Thank good. you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Last Thursday, 100,000 students in Ontario walked out to protest the proposed deep cuts to our education system by this regressive Conservative government. In my riding of Humber River Black Creek, students from C.W. Jeffries, Emory, James Cardinal McGuigan, St. Basil's and Westview came out in the hundreds. I dropped by the walkout organized by Emory Collegiate Institute students. A senior student approached me and shared his worries about the cuts to post-secondary education. He told me that eliminating OSAP grants and the grace repayment period would influence whether or not many of his friends would have a chance at going to college or university. He wants to know how exactly these cuts will help him and his friends get a world-class education. Questions to the Deputy Premier. The Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Referred to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. member opposite for the question. Our government was elected with a strong mandate to create good jobs in Ontario. And as the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities, my focus is on making sure that the people of Ontario are prepared for those jobs. We want everyone in Ontario to have an opportunity to succeed and prosper. And post-secondary education is a critical part of preparing Ontario for the future. Speaker, as we grow the economy, we need Ontarians who are skilled in sectors across the economy. And as minister, I will support programs and efforts 
that help students to get the skills Response. they need to find employment and help fill the skills gap. Post-secondary education is a critical part. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, this government is doing the exact opposite of what the minister is saying, but thousands of educators and people who care deeply about public education gathered on the front lawn of Queen's Park this past Saturday to protest this government's disastrous plan to balloon classroom sizes and eliminate thousands of teaching jobs within the next four years. Tell me how removing math teachers from our schools is going to improve math scores in this province. Minister. To the Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it's my pleasure to stand up and, and speak to the issue at hand because, again, no teacher is going to lose their job involuntarily. I cannot stress that enough. And in fact, we're investing in our teachers. I can't wait for the Minister of Finance to bring our budget forward tomorrow because, again, we are taking very strong steps forward to demonstrate how we're investing in the Ontario education system to make sure that we get it back on track once and for all after 15 years of failed ideology and experiments by the former Liberal administration. And do you know, NDP. it's interesting that uh, we need to make sure that our teachers are confident in the subjects that they're teaching in, and specifically with math. We're rolling in a curriculum over four years. We're going to be working with our education partners to make sure we get it right. And most importantly, any teacher who wants to improve themselves Response. and are interested in taking an additional qualification math course, we will invest in that teacher here, here. because we want the best in front of our students. Thank you. Supplementary is a member for Len North Centre. My question is for the Minister of Education. Speaker, today is the. Apologize. Sorry. <laughs> I made a mistake. I apologize. The next. No. The next question, member for Perry Sound Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, and Indigenous Affairs. Ontario is blessed with natural beauty and a rich history that draws vis visitors from all over the world. Tourism is a critical part of our province's economy and our government appreciates the jobs it creates all over Ontario. This is especially important for the northern regions of Ontario. There are adventures to be had in northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and our government is supporting the growth of unique tourism opportunities in the north. Can the minister Tell the members of this House about how our government is supporting tourism in the North and making Northern Ontario open for business and open for jobs. Minister for Energy, Northern Development and Mines, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and uh, since coming to government, uh, we've sharpened our focus in Northern Ontario, especially through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, to, for economic development, business development, business diversification, and importantly, job creation. And that extends to tourism very much because we want to celebrate our vast and beautiful space with the rest of the world, Mr. Speaker. We recently invested $456,000 in Thunder Bay to help salesuperior.com buy that new catamaran to accommodate larger groups, Northwest helicopters to establish an aerial tour and charter operations for visitors to the area. And the town of Marathon is also receiving $140,000 to make waterfront upgrades. Mr. Speaker, these are serious investments. For the town of Marathon, strategically positioned on a natural deep water port, we see an incredible opportunity. Who knows? Maybe the, the love boat will park there someday, Mr. Speaker. Response. But in the meantime, we want to create economic opportunities for these towns and businesses so people from around the world can celebrate our vast and beautiful space. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for his response. I'm very happy to hear our government recognizes the importance of tourism in Ontario's north, and it's taking concrete steps to make sure that this industry continues to thrive and grow. As I'm sure members of this House will understand, growing tourism in northern Ontario would take collaboration across government. Can the minister tell us what other ministries are doing to grow tourism in northern Ontario and across the province? Minister. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Referred to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And thanks to the member from Perry Sound Muskoka for giving me the opportunity to speak about how we're growing tourism in Northern Ontario. 
Our government provides strategic support to festivals and events in the north through the Celebrate Ontario program, along with support for planning projects through the Tourism Development Fund. Last month, we wrapped up our in-person tourism roundtables with frontline tourism operators from across the province. Their input, Mr. Speaker, along with over 7,000 online submissions we received from tourists, operators and students will be considered as we develop Ontario's new tourism strategy. This new direction, Mr. Speaker, will help us continue to grow tourism in Ontario, Ontario's north, and I look forward Response. to sharing this new strategy later this year with the House. Thank you. Next question, the member from London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Education. Speaker, today is the International Day of Pink, a day where communities across the world wear pink to raise awareness to stop homophobia, transphobia, transmisogyny, and all forms of bullying. LGBTQ plus students still face bullying in our schools. In fact, research shows that 87% of trans students have felt unsafe at school and 77% of trans Canadians have considered suicide. One death by suicide is one too many. Across this house, across party lines, we have a duty to act. On the International Day of Pink, what is the minister doing to ensure LGBTQ plus students feel safe in Ontario schools? Yeah. Questions to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to say that I'm standing with all of my colleagues today wearing pink to demonstrate and our commitment and our conviction that every person matters, no matter what color, stripe, or relationship that they, they have. The fact of the matter is what we're doing is making sure we have a modern and age-appropriate curriculum in health and physical education to make sure students right out of the gate are learning about what healthy relationships look like. And I look forward to working with the members opposite as we release this curriculum and they'll come to embrace this new modern age-appropriate curriculum as well. I'm confident of that. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, it would be nice to hear the minister be able to say the words homophobia and transphobia on this day of pink, because that is what this day is about. Here, here. If the minister wanted to make our schools safer for LGBTQ plus students, she would support an inclusive curriculum that all children can access. Statistics show that there's a 93% drop in suicide rates among trans youth when parents and mentors accept their gender identity. The government expresses its values through the educational curriculum, yet this minister has delayed teaching gender expression until grade eight, when we know LGBTQ plus students need support much earlier than this. Through you, Speaker, why is this minister taking away support from LGBTQ plus students during a time when she should be offering more? And can the minister Question. say the words homophobia and transphobia? Thank you. Members, please take their seats. Minister to reply. Actually, those those words don't exist in my vocabulary because it's about the actions that really matter. Here, here. I'm thinking of Order. Craig. I'm, think, I'm thinking of my friend Craig. I'm thinking of my friend Frank. I'm thinking about my family members who we embrace. We don't we don't classify and we don't use terms to label. We embrace relationships. We em, we embrace healthy relationships, and that is what our curriculum is going to reflect when it's released in September next year. Thank you. That concludes our time for question period this morning. I erred. I'll, I'll recognize the uh, member for Kitchener Conestoga. Thank you. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources. As government members, we all know the record of the previous Liberal, go Liberal government when it came to hunting and angling. For 15 years, they ignored the concerns of folks who enjoy these great sports which are part of our heritage in Ontario. And the NDP are even worse, Mr. Speaker, when it comes when they're reporting uh, sorry, when they were supporting the Liberals, they were busy writing campaign platforms that didn't add up and didn't even mention hunting and angling. The bait fish industry supports jobs at mom and pop run shops all across this province by catering to the needs of anglers. Can the minister update the house on what our government for the people is doing for the bait fish industry? 
Mr. Natural Resources. Yes, sir. <coughs> thank you, Speaker. I want to thank uh, the member for his question. I know he's a passionate hunter and angler, and this is an issue that's close to his heart. I also want to thank him for his, the great work he's doing on our caucus advisory team as well. Before I answer, I want to recognize my parliamentary assistant, the member for Haldeman Norfolk, for the uh, great work that he's been conducting around the province on roundtables. He has heard firsthand from the baitfish industry about the issues facing them. Under the leadership of our Premier, Ontario is finally open for business mm -hmm. and open for jobs, and the baitfish industry supports jobs in rural Ontario as part of the $2.5 billion, billion fishing industry and that it contributes that much to Ontario every year. There are 1.3 million recreational anglers in this province, and our government will continue to improve the experience for any Ontarian who wants to enjoy these great pastimes. Thank you, Speaker. The member for Mississauga Centres informed me she has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to take a moment to commemorate the ninth anniversary of the tragic small plane crash that took place in Russia in 2010. The crash killed 96 people on board, including former president of the Republic of Poland, Lech Kaczyński, and Ryszard Kaczorowski, Poland's last president in exile. I would like to ask for unanimous consent to honour the victims with a moment of silence. The member from Mississauga Centre is seeking unanimous consent of the House to have a moment of silence. Agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you very much. Point of order, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I'd like to invite all members to the Assembly this afternoon as we recognize the Day of Pink to uh, combat bullying, transphobia and homophobia this afternoon. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Ottawa Centre is given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility concerning the Honolulu Report. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for London North Centre has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Education concerning the Day of Pink. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. We have a deferred vote on Government Notice of Motion No. 35 as amended relating to allocation of time on Bill 87, an act to amend various statutes related to energy. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
ask the members to please take their seats. On April 9, 2019, Mr. Clark moved government notice of motion number 35 relating to allocation of time on Bill 87. All those in favour of the motion will please, as amended, will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bethenfall. Mr. Bethenfall. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rick. Mr. Rick, Mr. Phillips, Mr. Phillips, Mr. Miller, Perry Spound, Muskoka, Mr. Miller, Perry Spound, Muskoka, Mr. Coe, Mr. Coe, Mr. Downey, Mr. Downey, Mr. Gill, Mr. Gill, Mr. Cook, Mr. Cook, Mr. Kalandra, Mr. Kalandra, Mr. Parsa, Mr. Parsa, Ms. Skelly, Ms. Skelly, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, Ms. Triantafilopoulos, Ms. Triantafilopoulos, Mr. Sicario, Mr. Sicario, Mr. Osterhoff, Mr. Osterhoff, Ms. Park, Ms. Park, Mr. Nichols, Mr. Nichols, Ms. Kusendova, Ms. Kusendova, Mr. Romano, Mr. Romano, Mr. Harris, Mr. Harris, Ms. Gamari, Ms. Gamari, Mrs. Carahalios, Mrs. Carahalios, Mrs. Fee, Mrs. Fee, Mr. Cho Willadale, Mr. Cho Willadale, Mr. Crawford, Mr. Crawford. Ms. Kanjin. Ms. Kanjin. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Quartha. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Quartha. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Cazetta. Mr. Cazetta. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Canapathy. Mr. Canapathy. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Baba. Mr. Baba. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tanagaslin. Mr. Tanagaslin. Mr. Roberts. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Sabau. Mr. Sabau. All those opposed to the motion as amended will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Madam Jelena. Madam Jelena. Mr. Tabbis. Mr. Tabbis. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Ba Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosovich. Mr. Rakosovich. Ms. Monty Farrell. Ms. Monty Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. The ayes are 62, the nays are 35. The ayes being 62 and the nays being 35, I declare the motion carried. This House stands in recess until 2 p.m.